You're listening to Economics Detective Radio. My guest today is Stephen Smith. He was formerly a real estate reporter writing for New York Yimby, Market Urbanism, Forbes, and Reason Magazine, but now he's a an analyst at a real estate firm. Stephen, welcome to Economics Detective Radio. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So to start off, you were the blog editor at New York Yimby. Uh, can you tell us what a Yimby is? It was a, uh, a sort of real estate, New York City real estate trade publication. But I, I would say that the uh, Yimby movement, I'm not sure who coined the term exactly, but I think Sonia Trauss in San Francisco in the Bay Area popularized it. I guess it's a, a movement of people who are uh, trying to counter a uh, longstanding force in, uh, I guess, any country's land use politics of, you know, the what they call NIMBY, not in my backyard. You know, people show up to local, you know, zoning meetings and complain that, you know, new housing and new office space is going to bring, you know, parking challenges and it's going to overcrowd the schools and cast shadows on our lawns and, you know, things like that. So it's a, I guess it's a, a broadly uh, pro-development movement, especially in uh, cities and regions that are experiencing uh, skyrocketing housing prices and uh, lots of uh, land use regulation. So the NIMBYs stands for Not In My Backyard, want to keep neighborhoods how they are or sort of keep them low density and maybe keep the sunshine on their lawns and, and the, uh, their neighborhoods fairly exclusive. So Yimby is, yes, in my backyard, as in, yes, let's build a skyscraper. Yes, let's develop some of the focuses, I believe, are, are mixed-use, high-density neighborhoods. I mean, that's an admirable sort of goal and one that I definitely share. So in May of 2016, there was a very interesting article in the New York Times titled, 40% of the buildings in Manhattan could not be built today. Now that was based on a piece of research that you did. So can you tell us where that figure comes from? Yeah, so that's that's actually a conservative floor. It's really at least 40% of buildings have uh, major zoning violations in New York City. That is to say, you know, when they were built, they were legal for the most part. Uh, but now, you know, they, if they burn down, for example, they could not be built today. So New York City has, uh, I think, uniquely among cities in at least the United States, has a pretty open um, land use and zoning database that, you know, for every parcel in the city, it tells you roughly to what density it's built, roughly to what height it's built. And you can sort of impute other things from the data, like what, you know, how much of the lot it covers or how much parking there is in the structure. And then you can compare that to, you know, the underlying zoning. So, you know, there's alphabet soup of, you know, um, I don't know, what's an example? Like R6 slash C12 or whatever, you know. And, and, you know, all of these zones, they allow a certain amount of density that is, a, you know, a certain ratio of building to a lot area. And they allow, you know, a certain amount of height in some cases. They allow, you know, they require a certain, you know, number of parking spaces. They allow a certain number of, uh, amount of lot coverage. So, you know, if it's the interior lot, you can cover, I don't know, 70% of your lot with a structure. And if it's a corner, you can, anyway, that's, so what I did was uh, I took every zoning district and then in, you know, I wrote some code in Ruby, if anyone is interested. And then I compared that to what, you know, the city has actually built on the lot. Um, and from that, you can determine that, you know, certain buildings have too much density. So the Empire State Building. Uh, is built to a, a floor area ratio of 30, which means that if you divide the total amount of square footage in the building by the total square footage of the actual land, you know, it, it, it's 30 times. So, you know, a, a, a building with an FAR of 30 would, if it fills its whole lot, it'll be 30 stories. If it fills half the lot, it'll be 60 stories, et cetera. Anyway, so I think, I, I'm not exactly sure, but I, I believe that that, parcel is only zoned for 15, a floor area ratio of 15. So it's built to twice the density. So if you do this, you know, if, if you run this, these calculations for every lot in Manhattan, not the whole city, the whole city is a little harder and the number would probably be a lot higher. Um, and I, and, and you, you know, you only look at the, the major zoning violations that could be determined with the data because there's lots of other zoning violations that don't really show up in the data. So for example, you know, the a building can rise straight from the street for, you know, whatever, I don't know, 80 feet or something like that. And then above 80 feet, it has to sort of step back. And, you know, you can't really find that in the data. So I can't say with certainty that, you know, 
I can't say that the other 60% don't violate zoning rules, but at least 40% of the you know, structures in Manhattan um, violate these rules. Um, and then, of course, there are other rules beyond zoning that a lot of them violate. So, for example, nowadays, if you build any, any building of any considerable size, it needs sprinklers. But uh, if you've ever been in a New York City tenement, they don't have sprinklers. So those are violations that I didn't even touch. Those are, you know, building code violations, habitability rules, things like that. Or nowadays you can't build a six-story building, I don't think, without an elevator. And not all the six-story buildings in Manhattan have elevators. So it's really a, a conservative floor. It's really the at least 40% couldn't be built today. Wow. So I, I guess the interesting thing is when we think about, or when most people think about regulation, they think that we regulate to stop really bad things, you know, obviously we regulate to stop people from being served uh, poison meat and, and stuff, mm-hmm. and, and we regulate buildings to keep you from building something, some sort of hideous monstrosity that ruins the neighborhood around it, but mm-hmm. looking at something like the Empire State Building, that's the crown jewel of Manhattan, right? And, and to, yeah. for regulate, you know, we don't need regulation to protect us from the Empire State Building. We we like the Empire State Building. So I think I mean, you know, yeah. people in New York like the Empire State Building, but if you tried to build something like it today, I, I don't, they probably wouldn't like it. So, you know, when the Empire State Building was built, they demolished, I believe, the old Astor Hotel, which was a, nowadays, if you looked at it, you'd think, wow, what a beautiful building, you know, you should never tear this down. But well, they did tear it down and they built the Empire State Building and now the Empire State Building is probably more beloved than the old building would have been. But, um, I don't know if you tried to if you tried to build the Empire State Building today, you know, you know, modern design. I'm sure a lot of people would find it to be a hideous monstrosity. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and like you know, over when things are built, they're often not seen as as attractive as they you know become in a hundred years once they become you know an integral part of the city's skyline. Yeah, I, I remember people saying that about uh, the Eiffel Tower when it was built. That people thought, oh my God, this is such an eyesore. Yeah, I don't, I don't remember who said it, but someone said, uh, you know, it's his favorite place to eat lunch in the Eiffel Tower because it's the only place in the city you can't see it. And now, <laughs> now they say the same thing about the, like, the, the Tour Montparnasse, which is like the, the one skyscraper, the, the big, you know, prominent skyscraper in Paris that I guess was like the last one they built before they banned all the further skyscrapers. Um, I think my favorite example that I just read the other day that, uh, you know, in London about, I don't know, in, in the beginning of the 2000s, they started encouraging or they, uh, they, they, they started reallowing, you know, skyscrapers in the city of London, which is like the, the city's financial core. And one of the first buildings built was, was called the Gherkin, which is like, you know, a cucumber. And it's, it's like this cucumber looking building. I think officially it's called the you know, Swiss rebuilding or something. Anyway, uh, when it was built, it was viewed, you know, this was only about 13 years ago, it was viewed as this like terrible monstrosity that, you know, marred the cityscape and detracted from famous, you know, older churches and you know, whatever was viewable on the skyline. And then it became sort of a beloved part of the city. And, and now I, I read this article the other day that they were trying, that they were proposing to, uh, I don't know who, I don't know if it was actual planners or just some newspaper or blog, but you know, they wanted to preserve the sightline views of the Gherkin. It was like a 13-year-old building. So I guess that's, a, that's an extreme example of something going from hated to beloved. But architecture always goes through style changes. So when the New York City's famous brownstones were first built, you know, there are these uniform sort of chocolate covered buildings with high stoop they sort of had these these uniform lot you know that you get a whole row of them and they look exactly the same and when they were first built they were you know viewed as very beautiful and stately and then they were built in the 1860s 70s 80s um and then by the the early 20th century you know the 1910s 1920s they they fell out of fashion and people started lobbing off the stoop you know they started facing them in stucco and they, they just thought they were really ugly and now, of course, it, the pendulum has swung the other way, and now they're viewed as, I guess, maybe the most iconic New York City building type other than the, the tenement. So, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and it changes all the time, and it, it's really hard to regulate aesthetics and have it seem logical and make sense, you know, 100 years later. So it's a difficult task. I would not do it at all, but cities have decided that they're going to regulate aesthetics, and it comes with all these strange pitfalls and ironies. Yeah, it seems like we've created a lot of rules that they're based on these aesthetic considerations, but we seem to slant the rules in favor of not taking risks and not building something that we might think is ugly when, of course, people need to live in buildings. And so, yeah, yeah. you know, the, the aesthetic I mean, the, should maybe be secondary. 
Yeah, and it, I mean, it's not only aesthetics. When zoning was first introduced in 19, it first came to New York City in 1916, and it was, it was really the first real thing that would be recognizable to this today as a zoning code in the United States. People assumed that it was, you know, for health and safety, but it really wasn't. You know, the, the Tenement House Act of 1901 was, was about health and safety, but by 1916, uh, it, was really about, it was really about preserving property values. And, you know, up until then, there was this sort of constant decline of New York City neighborhoods. So, you know, the rich people would move into a neighborhood and then, you know, the retail would follow them. And then, you know, the manufacturers would follow them. And then, you know, before you knew it, in, in like, for example, in 1916, Fifth Avenue was the main spine of Manhattan. And the, uh, the stretch from 23rd Street to 34th Street was, it, it, was a, it was a very prime residential neighborhood. But then, you know, these retailers started coming in. And then the manufacturer, you know, because they were essentially clothing retailers. And the manufacturers, you know, at the time, New York City's biggest industry, I believe, was the garment industry. So, you know, they wanted to be close to the retailers so that they could, you know, figure out what the latest styles were, they could get their product to the market very quickly. So the streets were just inundated with these Eastern European and Southern European, you know, Italian, Russian, Polish, especially Jews. And they were sort of, they were viewed as, you know, destroying this prime retail district. So you had these, you know, waspy old, you know, the, the carriage trade, the silk stocking trade, you know, these, these, you know, women of German and Irish and, you know, or not Irish, but English descent, who would, you know, come and they'd visit these stores around noon. Um, you know, they'd take their carriages and they'd come from Upper Fifth Avenue and they'd shop. And then, you know, you'd have these, you know, sort of dirty, unwashed Jewish Italian masses who would be, you know, swarming the streets and it was viewed as just, just not good for business. And nowadays we look back on it and we say that's totally racist. This is xenophobic. This is just totally bigoted. But that's the basis of modern zoning. And now we've developed these other explanations for why it exists. But the reason that you can't build a factory on Fifth Avenue, it's really not about the proverbial glue factory next to your home. It's really about why are the Southern Eastern you know, Europeans flocking the street. Now the immigrants are you know, a different color. They're from different places. But you definitely see in New York, you know, now we're a little more politically correct about it. We don't explicitly talk about you know, immigrants forming these neighborhoods. But it's still, you know, if you, if you look at the subtext behind a lot of these zoning actions, especially in, in the outer fringes of the city that are becoming more and more populated by immigrants, you see the same undertones for sure. People don't want to admit it, but I see it. So the zoning came in, did it drive out people who were already there or was it to stem the tide of people who were coming in? So, so one of the strange things about zoning is that, you know, most health and safety regulations, they apply to things that are built into things that were once there. So in New York City, you need to have hot water in your building, you know, for sanitary reasons. And, you know, whether the building was built as, you know, what's called a cold water tenement, you know, without any hot water or as a modern building, it needs hot water. It's a requirement. But with zoning, you, the, the old buildings are what's called grandfathered in. So if you have you know, the Empire State Building, you don't have to tear down the Empire State Building, which I think sort of hints at, at the fact that, like, this is not really a necessary scientific sort of regulation. If it was, you know, if it was really dangerous to, you know, have shadows, and it was really dangerous to, you know, I mean, even really not have sprinklers in a six-story building, we wouldn't let people live in these buildings, but we do. So you could say, oh, you know, you're, we're, we're weighing the pros and cons, it'd be terrible to evict all these people, but at the end of the day, I don't think most people want tear down the Empire State Building. I don't think they want to tear down these buildings that are overbuilt, which I think just sort of hints at the fact that, like I said, these are not scientific hardline regulations that are sort of backed up by, you know, academic literature. They're, they're sort of what people were feeling at the time. You know, they felt that Fifth Avenue should, you know, have a height limit of whatever, and Midtown shouldn't have a height limit, you know, whatever. Like, so they're sort of arbitrary. And the fact that the fact that they don't apply retroactively, I think, sort of hints at that. Yeah, so the New York Times posted an animated time lapse of the New York City skyline over the last mm -hmm. 500 years, so starting from just, you know, a swampy little island, uh, and then I'll post a link to it at economicsdetective.com slash yimby. The thing that struck me about the video was that you start out with this sort of, these big waves of gradual changes, you know, you start from this uninhabited island you get a whole bunch of you know some land reclamation wooden buildings one and two stories and you gradually gets denser you're replacing them with two and three story buildings made out of brick and then concrete and then 
right around the time you mentioned, 1916, you know, early 20th century, the pace of change sort of changes. So instead of having, it's late 19th century, you start to see the first skyscrapers, but you also see this gradual change of from three-story buildings to five-story buildings. But in the 20th century, the change goes from gradual to these short bursts, like either a building stays exactly as it is, or it gets Mm -hmm. torn down and replaced with a hundred story skyscraper. So could you comment, why did it happen that way? What, What about zoning and the regulations that the city adopted made development sort of a sporadic thing instead of a gradual thing? Yeah, so so 1916 was the first zoning code, but I think looking back today on it, it you know really wasn't that strict by modern standards. The real strict zoning code came in New York City in 1961, and in other cities in the U.S. around the same time, and in the suburbs a little you know five to ten years later, but you know all sort of around the 60s and 70s. Um, and what happened in Manhattan is you know the the presumption in 1916 was you could build pretty much anywhere you want, except you know we're going to zone these there, you know Fifth Avenue in particular, we're going to zone it more you know strictly. Um, you know, on the Upper West Side, you know, these grand thoroughfares and zone those a little more strictly, but everything else is the presumptions you can build. Uh, in 1961, they kind of reversed. It went from, you know, you can build everywhere but these places that we don't want you to build to you can build nowhere but these places that we want you to build in. So traditionally um, in Manhattan, you know, the east side of the city was more desired. The, the east side of Midtown was more desirable than the west side. The east side was sort of a little more restricted, so you couldn't build uh, factories, but I think made it a little more desirable. And then the west side was the Garmin district, and you build wherever you want there. So development was gradually heading westward anyway, because, you know, they, they'd sort of run out of really prime, ripe, soft sites on the east side that were sort of low built. Because, you know, when, once you build sort of a, you know, 15, 20 story building, it becomes really hard to tear it down. You know, you, you got to really think that you're going to make a ton of money to make it worthwhile to tear that down. So, you know, it's sort of gradually moving westward, but it wasn't really fast enough for the city's liking. So they zoned it a little more, you know, more tightly in 1961. And then in the 80s, they you know, had this plan that, you know, the, 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 the idea was to move the development westward and, you know, and suppress the de- sort of gradual development on the east side and then, you know, really encouraged it on the west side. And the 1961 zoning code also had these provisions that encouraged slender, taller towers. So when I was uh, earlier, I was talking about the floor area ratio, the FAR calculation. So, you know, if you want to build to an FAR of 15, which is more or less the maximum in Manhattan that you're allowed to build, if you build a bulky building, it's only 15 stories, you know, it fills the entire lot. But in 1961, they encouraged them to build these slender towers in these sort of like plazas. And so you needed a large amount of land and then you'd build on a tiny bit of it and you'd build like a really tall tower. So, you know, the, the, the sort of typical, very high density residential tower went from, you know, 15, you know, bulky 15 story building in the 1950s and early 60s to right after that, you know, the, a sort of taller 30, 40 story building. So it really, it didn't necessarily increase the bulk, but it really did raise the impact on the skyline. And the same thing happened for office buildings. In fact, you'd get a, a bonus if you, you know, made this plaza around it in a taller building. And the, the idea at the time was to encourage more open space. But in reality, these plazas are not really well used. They're these windswept concrete wastelands. And they sort of tinkered around the edges of it, but the, the, the basic incentives are still there for you to build taller. And it's, it's really like a balloon. You know, the city is really like a balloon that you're inflating. And if you just sort of let it go, you know, you sort of inflate the balloon and it gradually inflates. But if you start, you know, like a balloon animal, you start pressing on certain things and restricting certain things, then, you know, certain areas just, you know, go crazy. So in um, Manhattan, the, the most, the place where you can build the most freely is in Midtown. So all of this density gets like pulled up in Midtown and, and in Brooklyn, it's in downtown Brooklyn and Williamsburg. And then in Queens, it's on the Long Island city waterfront. So whereas normally you might have this sort of gradual intensification of especially lower density neighborhoods that, you know, maybe have a single family home on a large lot, you know, sort of detached home on a large lot that's really ripe for development because, you know, you don't have any tenants in there to buy, you know, there's no leases to worry about, you just buy the home, demolish it. Instead, they sort of encourage it in these prime waterfront locations. And so you get these really tall towers, which may have been built anyway, but, you know, in comparison to what's being built or not built elsewhere, they're, you know, they're a lot larger than they might otherwise be under a, a no zoning or a, you know, lighter zoning regime. Right. I sort of come around to the view that without these zoning and regulations, 
you wouldn't necessarily have a lot of skyscrapers. You'd have a lot of two, three-story buildings, mixed use, close together, which is the way that most cities were built for most of history. I, I, th- I think you would have towers in the really expensive locations, but I guess Canadian cities are probably a prime example of, you know, Canadian cities have quite loose housing supplies, but it's almost entirely concentrated in these towers on arterial roads or downtown. So in Vancouver, you have the like the point block towers where it's like, you know, a large podium and then a little you know, sort of tower on top. And then in Vancouver, you have like the large slab or sorry, in Toronto, you have like the large slabs. But so in, in Toronto and Vancouver, especially in the greater areas in the suburbs, if you want to build a six or, you know, 30 story building, or 60 story building, you can, you know, you, you have to submit a rezoning application, but you can do it. But, you know, if you want to tear down a detached home on a large lot and build, you know, a bunch of sort of dense three-story townhouses, um, like, you know, were built in New York City in the late 1800s or, you know, Houston today, which doesn't have a zoning code and which really encourages these little infill townhouses, you can't. So, and I think the Canadian viewers, or listeners, the, uh, the result is that you have very strict supply of these low-rise housing types. You know, they don't allow a lot of sprawl, which maybe has its benefits of not allowing sprawl, but they also don't allow, like, infill, you know, low-rise homes. So, like, you know, you, you can't, you know, in Vancouver, you can't, like, tear down a large, you know, a home on a detached lot in on the west side and, you know, build these dense townhouses. So the supply of these low-rise housing is, is very strict, and I think the planners sort of hope that the low-rise and the high-rise housing are just perfect substitutes for each other. And, you know, you can suppress the low-rise all you want, and people just move to the high-rise which is true to some extent, especially if you're only looking for a one bedroom or studio, you know, once you have a family and you want a lot of space, you know, there, there's sort of a limit to how cheaply you can build a mid or high rise building. And, you know, at the end of the day, the, the cheapest housing is always, you know, these sort of three story wood frame buildings, which they don't allow a lot, you know, new ones. So in Canada, you have this, you know, crazy appreciation of single family homes and, you know, low rise homes in general. And then, you know, condo prices are not flat, but a lot flatter, at least, you know, and a lot more affordable. Um, And I think, you know, planners there, I don't think they've really acknowledged what they've done. But I think that ordinary people, you know, when you go and try to buy a family sized unit, whether it's in a tower or a low rise, can really see the effects of it, you know, and see how expensive it's become. Yeah, I I think with Manhattan, because there's, you know, that natural barrier of the water, it is an island. It's one of mm-hmm. the places where even in a free market, it, it might build very tall buildings, but they certainly wouldn't have tall, skinny buildings uh, surrounded by sort of useless plazas. I mean, they might have to, like, you know, if you look in suburbs in America in the 1950s, when the, the rules were still kind of loose, there were some taller buildings. There weren't a ton of them, but there were some. So it's really hard to say what the market would choose once you've gotten so far from the market equilibrium. But um, I think there has been a movement back towards cities. And you look at a place like Japan, which is not really that land. Cons- I mean, it's not really, you know, there's a bay, but they fill in the bay. And, you know, they, there's sort of like a sprawling plain in all directions from Tokyo. And you get a lot of really dense low-rise stuff. Although in recent years, they've, they've loosened the high-rise rules. And you see a lot more of those as well. Um, the sweet spot is probably, what, once you go above like 30 stories, your construction costs go really high so you know above 30 stories would probably not happen in that many places but i mean it it, it really depends on the market and it depends on how densely it's already built and what kind of draw there is to the city center i don't necessarily you know when when i look at a a, a totally high you know cities like vancouver and toronto where all the construction is high rise i'm not sure that there would be let fewer high rises in a in an unzoned version of toronto or, or vancouver but there would definitely be relatively there you know the new construction, relatively speaking, would be in much lower units. So there might be a, a little bit, you know, some fewer towers, but there'd be a lot more low-rise density. So the mix would certainly be a lot more tilted towards shorter buildings, shorter, denser buildings. So New York City is one of many cities where people talk about the the housing affordability crisis. And of mm-hmm. course, we we've talked about some of the causes with uh, zoning and and very restrictive building policies. H- has the character of the city changed because the rents are so expensive? I mean, certainly the the demographic character of the city has changed. In I can't remember exactly what the statistics are, but I believe in the '90s 
of all the newcomers to the city, about two thirds of them were international immigrants, mostly from, you know, poor countries in, you know, Asia, Latin America. And nowadays, I think it's reversed. And now about two thirds of them are from elsewhere in the United States. They tend to be what we might call a gentrifier, you know, somebody who grew up in an upper middle class suburb of some, you know, city, some large or small city, and now has moved to New York to, you know, to their, their, I don't know, their career in real estate investment, like myself, or, um, you know, journalism, or, you know, marketing, whatever. So, you know, when you have a limited, when you have a limited supply of housing, and it's available more or less on an open market, um, the richer people will always take it first. And, you know, immigrants have a, have a way of, you know, they double up, they triple up, you know, you get a three bedroom apartment that might house three families. So, you know, they can afford to some extent to pay these higher ends, but there becomes a point in which it's just really not worth it anymore. And they, you know, they skip the city entirely. They go straight to the suburbs, you know, they go straight to, you know, other regions, maybe, maybe the South, maybe the Southwest. You know, they, they skip, you know, the big northeastern and coastal California cities entirely. Certainly, you see that in the Bay Area now. So, you know, and people really complain about, you know, neighborhoods like the village, Greenwich Village, which was probably, I don't know, I think it was the most tightly, con- tightly zoned neighborhood after the 1961 zoning code. And basically no development was allowed whatsoever for a couple decades. And they, they loosened it a little bit, but not really. You know, people always complain that it's a complete ghost town. And it is. You you know, you walk the streets of there and, you know, none of the lights are on. There's nobody on the streets, you know, outside of the, the major commercial arteries. And, you know, the people who are on the streets, they, you can tell they're not from there. They're not, you know, really wealthy people. You know, they come there to work or to drink or whatever, and they go home at night. Um, so I, you know, it's a big city and there's, you know, I think people who complain that the city has, you know, changed completely probably don't leave the core very much. Um, but it is true that, you know, the neighborhoods are changing and, you know, especially the, the close in neighborhoods, you know, Manhattan and then, you know, near the waterfront in Brooklyn and Queens, they definitely are changing. They're losing their, you know, diverse immigrant character and they're becoming very homogeneously, you know, white, a little bit Asian and very wealthy. Yeah, I'm a big fan of the musical Rent, which is about starving artists living in Manhattan in the 1980s. And mm-hmm. I, I would bet that there are no starving artists in Manhattan today. Maybe far uptown, but yeah, they'd probably set it in like central Brooklyn today. Yeah. And like, you know, that's, it's great that there's still a place for that in central Brooklyn, but, you know, beyond the ring of starving artists are these starving immigrants and they are, you know, being pushed farther and farther out the city's fringes and often beyond. And each group is really pushing the other, you know, the only group that can afford anything are, you know, the, I don't know, the Siberian potash magnates or the, you know, whatever, you know, oligarchs come, but, you know, everybody else is constrained, you know, even if you're a doctor, lawyer, banker, you know, you're, you might want to live on the Upper West Side, but you can't afford it, you're struggling to live there, so you move a little farther out, and then, you know, you have the, you know, the junior banker who's displaced a little farther out, and then you have the artist who's displaced a little farther out, and then you have the immigrant who's displaced a little farther out. And, you know, pretty soon you're just like another city entirely. Yeah. The, the other, um, and of course, there was the TV show Friends where uh, Rachel is a waitress and somehow has a giant apartment. And you, you sort of, from a perspective of having been to New York a few times and, and rented a, a place the size of a shoebox that was an illegal Airbnb for quite a lot of money, you know, I, I can honestly say that it's very hard to watch reruns of Friends and not just notice that glaring unrealism. Yeah, I think I think it was unrealistic when they aired. And I think I think the little like deus ex machina thing was that I think she inherited it. She inherited it like a rent controlled apartment from like her grandma or something. I think that was the, the conceit because it was it was unrealistic even at the time. Because like, I remember there was like this big like studio window and like, you know, even just like having a having a window in your common area kitchen is sort of, you know, can be a luxury now. Now, you know, landlords are like chopping up, you know, three better or two bedroom apartments, the three bedroom apartments. And, you know, yeah, I, I think it was unrealistic. at the time. Yeah. Cause of course they were not in a real apartment, but a sound stage in prob- yeah, probably yeah. in LA or, or somewhere where. Yeah. Where yeah. Have... And, they, they did, and like the, the ones in that apartment, like they didn't always have very good jobs. Yeah. It was, it was unrealistic. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you you mentioned rent control. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the the rent control uh, policies in New York? Yeah, so New York City's um, major rent control policies started after World War One. There was a you know wars are terrible for cities even if they're not fought in them because they divert resources. There was no construction around the time of World War One, um, and so prices were just 
skyrocketing going through the roof. So they instituted a, a, a you know, the city's first rent control ordinance, or I don't know if it's maybe it's at the state level. Um, anyway, the, the city's first rent control laws. Um, and then, you know, at the time they still believed that, you know, this was a, a temporary fix and that the long-term solution would be to simply build more housing. And as the 20s wore on, it, it happened. They built more housing, prices stabilized, and eventually they let the laws expire. Um, and then the depression happened, which really lowered demand. So there wasn't, you know, there wasn't a lot of construction, but there also wasn't a lot of demand for housing because, you know, people were losing their jobs. And then World War II came along, and World War II was the same. Obviously, nobody bombed New York City, but, you know, there was no construction from, you know, the, the economy might have recovered at the end of the 30s, and construction might have resumed, but then World War II came. So there was no construction throughout that. And then, you know, when people were coming home, you know, all these people were coming home to a city uh, that didn't really have room for them. So there was another rent control ordinance passed. And I think that had the 1961 zoning code not been passed and had, you know, construction been able to pick up, I think they probably would have let the rent laws expire as well. But they didn't. You know, construction never did pick up because 1961 happened. You know, private construction fell off a cliff. It became very, very difficult to build things. Not, on, not only was you know, everything really tightly zoned and you just simply couldn't build in many neighborhoods, but where you could build, you had to assemble these large lots and build these really tall, expensive towers, you know, surrounded by these plazas. So you know, it's just very hard to add to supply. So you know, it, it can be very difficult to argue against the rent control or what, you know, what we now call in New York City rent stabilization um, because you know, the, the normal thing that brings down prices is new supply, you know, supply and demand. But and demand is not really in effect in New York anymore. There's lots of demand and not a lot of supply. So, um, you know, politically speaking, the laws have persisted. And I think technically they're called, you know, temporary emergency laws, but, you know, they're renewed all the time. And it's hard from, you know, they, they have weakened the laws a little bit. So now when an apartment turns over, uh, it can more or less be deregulate, deregulated legally or illegally. So the laws have been loosened a little bit, but they're still, they're still like strongly in effect if you're actually in the apartment. I know you've been in there for a long time. And that's probably the only thing at this point keeping a lot of neighborhoods in Manhattan from becoming, you know, completely wealthy and white. And of course it has its cost because it, you know, if you're looking for a new apartment, there's all these units that are not on the market for you. But um, it doesn't seem politically feasible to get rid of it until, you know, prices stop rising like they have. And that's not going to happen unless major zoning changes are made, not only in New York City, but also in its suburbs. You know, the, the city of New York is only, you know, the five boroughs are only 40% of the region's um, total population. So, you know, you have the majority of the demand is probably for outside the city and the New York City suburbs, especially the ones in New York State, are uh, extremely anti-development, like, you know, way, way worse than New York City. The New Jersey side is a little better. Um, but, you know, Westchester and Long Island, are very, very anti-development in a way that makes New York City look not so bad. Um, so you have, you have that demand, you know, you have demand that's sort of, you know, you, you have this whole region's worth of demand. So, you know, the, the rent stabilization, rent control laws are um, definitely harming people looking for new leases, but it's sort of a political inevitability at this point. Yeah, so, so how exactly does it work? Did I have to be in an apartment at a certain rent when they adopted the rule during World War II in order to be sort of grandfathered in? So the really strict, what we call rent control laws, yes. Then, you know, up until I think it was the late 90s, you could uh, still, like, essentially how the rules work is the longer you've been in an apartment, the lower your rent is. There was different waves of regulation that are really not worth getting into. But the, the, the basic gist of it is the longer you've been there, the lower your rent likely is. Nowadays, it's virtually impossible to find a new rent stabilized apartment. So it's sort of a it's sort of a two tiered system where if you've been here for a while, you're protected. If you haven't, you're subject to the whims of the market or you know what little market there is still functioning. Um, you know the laws of not supply and lots of demand still subject to those. So they're phasing them out in that sense. So if they don't if they don't tighten them again, you know, in 60 years, there might not actually be much rent stabilization or rent control in New York City. But yeah, that's basically how it works. The longer you've been here, the lower your rent is. Um, but newcomers now, unless you, unless you can find, you know, an apartment that was sort of in some government program, you're not going to find anything that's subject to the rent stabilization laws. 
Right. So if I am a landlord and I have a tenant, you know, may, maybe I have a very old tenant who's been there since World War II or someone who's been there from one of the later waves of rent stabilization. Mm-hmm. I can't just evict that person. There, there are rules now. I, I am now obligated to provide them with an apartment forever like there there seems um, to be a lot of restrictions on yeah, landlords if, if it's a rent controlled apartment and it's from you know i don't know i don't remember what the cutoff is but if they've been in that apartment since 1950 they're probably not even paying enough to cover the taxes and like the water bill but if they've been there more recently they're probably covering the expenses and then you know a slight amount of profit um and what happens is when you sell a building you know, a, a, a landlord will look at what your rents are, and if your rents are really low and they can't be raised, you're not going to get as much for the building, you know, the, the value of the building can be lower. But yeah, you have to basically maintain the apartment uh, for them for as long as, as long as they and whoever's on the lease are still alive. So, you know, if, they, if their kids are in the apartment and their kids choose to stay in the apartment, you know, through adulthood, then their kids then become the, uh, you know, people on the lease and they become grandfathered into whatever arrangement there was. The exceptions are um, if the landlord themselves wants to occupy the unit or one of their family members wants to occupy the unit, they can kick you out for that. But, you know, in a large professionally managed building, that, that can't happen. And in fact, if the building is owned by um, an LLC, you know, limited liability corporation, you can't even do that. So, yeah, there aren't really very many exceptions. Some unscrupulous landlords, you know, if, if for example, the, you know, the tenant is an immigrant and they're not, you know, in the United States legally, they will threaten them with all these sorts of things or they'll, you know, withhold repairs and try to get them out. But especially in recent years, the rules have, you know, people have become very aware of their rights, especially as the, the difference between what they're paying and what the market rate um, is has increased. So, you know, the, there's, there's a lot more at stake now. You know, if you're, if you're paying $1,000 a month for an apartment that on the free market would go for $3,000, you're going to be a lot more vigilant about asserting your rights as a rent-stabilized tenant. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're basically, you know, it's, it's one of the very few areas in which the United States and even Canada, as I understand it, um, and a lot of the West still has price control. And, you know, it's sort of sacrosanct in New York, but elsewhere, you know, in like more Republican jurisdictions is seen as, you know, sort of communist plot. Um, so it's, it's interesting how they sort of live and how, you know, America's densest cities, you know, sort of live in this different political reality as everywhere else. You know, in a lot of states, illegal you know in texas it's illegal to pass rent, rent control laws yeah it there was a recent netflix series daredevil where the superhero character is uh, you know fights crime by night but is a new york city lawyer by day and one of the plots was protecting an old lady from her unscrupulous landlord who wanted to kick her out of her rent control apartment but to a lot of people watching who are maybe more skeptical of rent control you kind of go Huh. So he owns the building and she pays nothing and he wants to do something with it. How does that make him the villain, right? It's, or, or yeah. Does does I mean, rent control it, constrain development in big ways? It doesn't constrain development because it doesn't apply to new buildings. Actually, that's not entirely true, but for for the most part it doesn't apply to it doesn't apply to new buildings. So I don't think it constrains development. What it really does is it changes the allocation of the existing building stock. So if you're trying to sign a new lease, you know, you don't have a lot of apart you don't have as many apartments available to you. I think it it probably the average price for New York City apartment is the same, but it, it sort of gives you a broader range of prices. So you have some people paying very little and some people paying a lot. If you suspended the rent the rent laws, you'd probably and you know the market rents would probably fall and the stabilized rents would obviously rise. It'd probably convert somewhere on the middle. But I think the real issue, I think a lot of conservatives especially are very worked up about rent control in New York City, but it's really not the cause of the issues. It's really the effect. It wouldn't be here if prices weren't rising. You know, in Canada, rent in major cities, I know they've been rising the last year or two, but before then, they, while we've seen this tremendous run up in single family home prices, rents have been relatively stable or, you know, in Japan, rents are always kind of stable or in Houston, rents are very stable. So I think it's, probably not as big of an issue as the uh, land use constraints when it comes to new development. I know that the uh, the city government hasn't tried upzoning many, big swaths of the city or, or even repealing land use restrictions to try to deal with the housing crisis. What have they tried doing? I would say that ever since 1961, I think the mayors 
the citywide officials, you know, the mayor has sort of realized what a mistake they made. And they've been, you know, the mayor in New York City is always pretty pro-development. Um, the problem is we've devolved power, you know, to a very low level. You know, we have a city council and the city council doesn't have a lot of power, but the one power they do have is over land use. And um, you know, there's, there's what's known as councilmanic prerogative, which basically means, you know, if there's a land use decision in, you know, a council member's district, all the other council members will defer to that person. So while in theory, you're making, you're taking a citywide vote, in practice, the, uh, the, the council member of the particular district has complete discretion over what to allow and what not to allow. And I think fundamentally, the issue is that, you know, if you kick governance down to these hyper local levels, everyone becomes extremely anti development. So one of the ways to combat this, and they've been very successful with in Japan, for example, is in Japan, a lot of the zoning is done at the national level. So you have these sort of local uh, parochial interests that, you know, maybe don't want shadows, maybe don't want to build more public schools, you know, maybe, you know, they want to maintain the parking supply in the neighborhood. Um, and, but then, you know, you have the national government that's very concerned with growth and want, you know, and, and will override these local cities and you know, provinces and tell them, no, you have to accept this construction. Um, I know Canada has a lot like that as well in Toronto. There's the Places to Grow Act and the Ontario Municipal Board, whereby the province will sort of step in and force recalcitrant cities to accept their share of density. Um, in the United States, unfortunately, we have a very local um, land use decision. So in New York City, you know, in theory, it's citywide, but in practice, it's done at the district level. And then in places like the Bay Area, you know, outside of San Francisco, you have far worse issues where essentially every neighborhood has its own little municipality. So like the city of Palo Alto or the city of Atherton, you know, they're really small little they're really towns, they're not even cities. And they have less than maybe 100,000 residents, and they have complete control over all land use decisions. So whereas the governor of California, you know, Jerry Brown is very concerned about the cost of housing, and, you know, the mayor of New York City is very concerned about the cost of housing, and you know, even the Obama administration is very concerned about the cost of housing, they don't have any power. Who has power are these, you know, very small, you know, municipalities elected in very low turnout elections. And so, so the way I see it is, I know there's a lot of conservatives and libertarians who think that, you know, the government closest to the people is best. When it comes to land use regulation, I don't believe that. I think that, you know, if you, if you take it down to even the most hyper-local level and do a poll of residents on your block about whether they want a six-story building on their block, of course, everyone's going to vote no every single time. In theory, they might like housing, but if it's near them, you know, well, maybe, maybe, we should, maybe everyone else should be accepting housing, not us. But, you know, when you leave every little you know, suburb their own, uh, you know, or in New York City, every single council district, you know, if you give them the power to make those decisions, they often make very poor decisions in the aggregate. Anyway, that's my opinion about it. So yeah, if I, if I own my house or a condo or something, and I have control over whether the other, whether there's more development on my block or in my small neighborhood, then uh, William Fischel's home voter hypothesis is that, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm going to fight that tooth and nail to preserve the value in my home, which, you know, is yeah. probably my largest investment. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And a ho homeowner, you know, encouraging the way that the United States and other countries have encouraged homeownership definitely contributes to these issues. You know, in 1916, when the zoning code was passed, it was largely passed at the behest of these large property owners. Nowadays, everyone is a property owner. You know, at the time, it was really just, you know, these sort of large landed interest who owned retail stores or, you know, plots of land on Fifth Avenue who had a say in it. Now, you know, every, you know, I don't know, what, two thirds of America, two thirds of American households own their own homes or something, you know. So you have that many more vested interests in maintaining, you know, the set of, you know, really landed interests. Everyone's become, you know, landed gentry. One more question. The Empire State Building, I, I looked it up before I started the interview. The Empire State Building was built in one year and 45 days, and that was at the height of the Great Depression. By contrast, uh, when the World Trade Center towers were destroyed in 2001, it took until 2013 to replace them. So what changed? The, the most favorable answer to modern construction would be it's a lot safer nowadays. You know, I think a lot of people died building the Empire State Building. That doesn't happen. So, you know, things are a little slower because of that. The World Trade Center in particular, that was, you know, an entirely government-directed project, probably directed by, you know, maybe the country's most inept government body, which is the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. Um, and, you know, the World Trade Center is the most expensive office building on Earth. The World Trade Center Path Station, which is the subway between Manhattan and New Jersey, was the most expensive 
train station on Earth, there was like a little underground passageway. There was the most expensive underground passageway in the earth, of, in the, on the Earth. There was a parking garage. There was the most expensive parking garage on Earth. So in that case, you know, it's a combination of understandable, reasonable things like, you know, greater safety. Also, you know, different construction techniques. You know, nowadays, I don't remember. I don't, I'm not a, like, an engineer, but, you know, we use tube frame construction, which I think is a little tougher, but it's um, more durable. It, the, the World Trade Center is a very tall building. Also, labor is more expensive. I'm not an engineer. It's hard for me to say why I got to the last floor. But specifically with the World Trade Center, there's also these issues of uh, a very inept government agency actually doing the planning and construction. Do you have any closing thoughts about anything we've talked about? I, I guess I would emphasize um, the role of governance in land use decisions. You know, it, it's all well and good to make these, you know, sort of fundamental cases for more density or less density. But at the end of the day, what I see really affecting things um, is the governance structure. And I think that if people are concerned about housing prices, I think they really need to look at where the decisions are made and, if possible, you know, try to kick them up to larger bodies, to, you know, in the United States, to the state level, in Canada to give, you know, I know Vancouver doesn't have a lot of provincial planning in the same way that Toronto does, you know, maybe that's a solution to their problem. I think it's incredibly impressive, the housing stock growth that Japan, Japanese cities, you know, Tokyo manages even, you know, on the backdrop of a stagnant or declining national population, but, you know, the amount of construction is really impressive. And um, I would also encourage people to, like, you know, look outside of your city for a solution. It's a big world out there. There's a lot of different ways of doing things, you know, and the way that your local city or state or province or country does things is probably not the best way of doing it. And there's lots of examples out there of different ways of doing things. And I encourage people to look at it. My guest today has been Stephen Smith. Stephen, thanks for being on Economics Detective Radio. Thanks for having me. All right, that concludes the episode. As I said before, you can find the show notes page at economicsdetective.com slash YIMBY. That's Y-I-M-B-Y. Yes, in my backyard is what it stands for. And we'll have all the stuff we mentioned there, and links, and a summary of the episode. I'll also post that video I talked about that was the time lapse of the Manhattan skyline for the past 500 years. It's very cool, and I highly recommend you check it out. Special thanks to those who support me on Patreon. Couldn't do it without you. If you want to become a supporter, go to economicsdetective.com support and click the link to Patreon. If you give uh, $5 per episode or more, I will send you a t-shirt. And I just got to look at the final design for those t-shirts. They are very cool. So consider doing that. Or you could give less. And if you give at least $1 per episode, then you get to hear some bonus content. For instance, I post the episodes to the Patreon feed a few days before I post them to the main feed, so you get things early. And for some episodes, I do what I call afterthoughts episodes, where I will uh, spend about 10, 15 minutes just elaborating on what we've talked about. They're just sort of little mini episodes that you can only get in the Patreon feed. So consider supporting the podcast economicsdetective.com slash support and thanks for listening